All right, guys, we're doing another episode of the Going Ballistic Podcast. Uh, now that I'm finally back in my uh, studio, we have a chance to do it on uh, Facebook Live. So this one is going to have a live video component along with it. Uh, if you guys want to follow along on Facebook, it'll be awesome. I'd love to have you on here. If I get a chance, I will try to answer your questions as they come in. Um, so participate, ask some questions. Be patient, though, because I might have a hard time seeing everything as it comes in. But it's been a while since I've done one of these, uh, and I know you guys have wanted one, so here we are. So for the podcast, where did we leave off last time? I think we discussed some differences between the Mossberg and the Remington 14-inch model shotguns. Um, the idea being, we talked last time how they weren't really shotguns because they're really a category of firearms by themselves because they're not handguns, but they don't have a buttstock and it's kind of this weird in-between purgatory. Well, I've thought about it a little bit more and man, uh, I think this might be my Mossberg pump action shotgun again with, with quote fingers. I got to figure out something to call these things. The reason is... Uh, I've always liked 870s before. They've always felt smoother to me. They've always been a little bit nicer. Sorry, Mossberg. I've just really liked the Remingtons, and it may just be biased, and that's what I've ex experienced with before. Um, but I'm familiar with them, so that's what I use. The problem is, in this configuration, these 14-inch configurations where they use the shockwave grip, I don't think the Remingtons as well suited as the Mossberg is this time. So some of the differences are, first, magazine capacity. The Mossberg's got the magazine capacity. It holds an entire extra shell. That's if we're using full-size shells. Now, of course, we'll, I'm going to cover that next about some of these mini shells. But so full-size capacity, it holds one more. And one more is a big percentage increase. I haven't figured it out, but it's a lot. So I like that. Uh, second, I really like the controls. I think I talked about that last time. Is on a Mossberg, uh, the thumb safety being on top is just perfect for this kind of shockwave grip. It, that's how you're going to be holding it with your, your shooting hand. So having the safety right there just makes sense versus having to manipulate it with your, uh, your trigger finger like you do on a Remington. Also, lefties, I mean, it's already perfect for you. The safety is already there. Another thing that's handy um, for ma manipulating the firearm is the slide bolt catch release. You know, on a Mossberg, it's right behind the trigger guard. Normally, I don't like it there because I think it gets in the way of your hand. But on these 14-inch shockwave models, I mean, man, that's just... It seems perfect to be able to engage it. Now, it's never been a problem for me before on the Remingtons being in front of the trigger guard, that little lever that releases the, uh, the pump action for you. Because with the buttstock, it's easy to be able to hold it into your shoulder and reach up with your firing hand to engage that or even turn it and pinch it in your, your arm. But if I'm honest with myself, what makes it easy to do on the Remington is the fact that that buttstock is there. So you take that buttstock away, it's going to make it harder, so it's a better position on the Mossberg. The safety, it's a better position on the Mossberg for this gun, and you get a whole extra round of capacity. That sounds like enough, but what I think has pushed me over the edge and made me really uh, want to use the Mossberg instead. Now, I'm, I'm trying them out. Mossberg has one sending to me. I think it just arrived at my gun shop today. Uh, Remington, I think, is sending me one to try out, so I'll try and give as, as much of an unbiased review as I can, even though I'm kind of spilling the beans here, uh, is the mini shells. If you guys aren't aware, Aguila, I think I'm saying that right, mini shells, they've been around for a while. I mean, gosh, I think I remember seeing them in like 2005 time period. What they are is little inch, inch and a quarter, something like that, long shotgun shells. The idea being that you don't always need a full payload of a shotgun shell. So these mini shells can do the job in, I don't know, a home defense situation or, or working with snakes or even just practicing with a gun. And the capacity is through the roof. Because the problem with shotguns is the shorter the barrel there and therefore the easier to maneuver, the less the capacity because they are a tubular magazine underneath the barrel. So yeah, a short barrel is handy, but you can only hold a couple shells. In order to hold like 12 shells, like my three gun shotgun, you need a barrel and a magazine extension out forever. So it's always been this horrible trade off with the shotgun. So with these mini shells, since they're shorter, they take up less space, you can fit a lot more. You can almost double the capacity. That's pretty cool. Now there's a downside to these mini shells. When they're so short, when they pop out of that magazine tube and they get onto the lifter, I think it's technically called the elevator on a shotgun, but I call it a lifter. 
when it pops out, those mini shells have a tendency to flip backwards and upside down because they are so short and the weight is all at the front because that's where the shot or the slug is. When they come back, they're able to flip over backwards and therefore not feed in. So that's a problem. They work great in the Winchester 1300s, as I'm told, but for the Mossberg 500 590 series, you can get an little adapter, which I happen to have right here on the desk. It's Opsol, O-P-S-O-L. It's made in Texas. They're very proud of Texas. They have the Texas state you know, design all over the thing. It's a little piece of hard, rubbery plastic. Uh, apparently, we're going to find out soon, it just snaps right up and into the 500 or 590 in the rear of the receiver. And because the lifter or the elevator is actually bars that stick out and it's not solid, they can move on either side of this device. And this allows those mini shells to apparently work perfectly, we'll see, so that it shortens that whole receiver up so as if it were made for a shorter shell. It doesn't need to be the same length anymore. And it's supposed to solve the problem. So this is, I don't know, 20 bucks, less than 20 bucks on Amazon. It got shipped right to me. I'm hoping it'll make the mini shells work. Now, that's gonna be a really cool gun to have around my property, I think, you know, for like a snake gun or something like that. And the problem with the Remington is that lifter, the elevator that lifts the shell up after it's racked out of the magazine tube before it's chambered, it's solid. So a device like this wouldn't work. So there's no way, as far as I know, to modify a Remington to take those mini shells. Now I've heard some people can do it, but I heard it's extremely involved and very difficult and not reliable. So, I mean, we're just looking at points against Remington here. Sorry guys. Uh, Trust me, I believe me, I, I love the 870. That's what I've always and only always shot before. But this time, uh, yeah, Mossberg may have, may have hit it out of the park on this one. So I think that's kind of cool. So for the topic for tonight's podcast, um, first off, remember I do the podcasts, one, because I like teaching stuff. I know you guys like hearing them. But two is I do it to advertise my own stuff. So I appreciate you guys support it. The Long Range Shooting Handbook. If you know about me and my podcast, you don't know my book now, you've been living in a hole, so I'll spare you guys the details. I appreciate your support on this. Keep spreading the word. Uh, it's 17 months in, sold about 23,000 copies now. I did the math and it's been a little over a half million in sales. Uh, that's amazing. So as a way to celebrate that, I'm doing an audio book. I am now starting chapter five. This is the copy of the book I'm using to read the audiobook, and I'm going to release it for free on Audible. So if you want the audiobook, uh, this book, I don't know if it's well suited to be an audiobook because there's so many diagrams, there's so many things in here that may not translate well in like a podcast, but I'm trying and I'm putting it out there for you guys. So I'm chapter five deep. Audiobook should be out in another uh, week or two. Uh, pause real quick for a question. Kevin wrote in, when does the advanced handbook come out? Kevin, not soon enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm trying to get it done, and then I don't do enough podcasts. People complain about the podcast, and then I do the podcast, and I don't get the book done. I'm sorry, man. Uh, it's, it's taken me longer than I, way, way, way longer than I expected. So many people have pre-ordered it. I'm seriously debating this. Uh, guys, if you agree with me, write in and let me know. I'm thinking about just refunding everyone's money that pre-ordered it, just because I feel so horrible about how long it's taking, and I don't want to take your money. So, I mean, and if I refund your money, I would just give you the new one for free when it comes out. So don't be biased and say you just want a free one. I just don't ever want to be that guy that uh, has you guys waiting for too long because I don't seem to be able to get it done. Kevin, thank you. I appreciate you liking uh, the first one, even though you're, you're anxious for the second one, so that's good. And Bob, you're awesome. Thank you, man. I appreciate the feedback. You guys, I get at least an email a day, at least one of just great feedback, so... I was afraid when I put the book out, there was just going to be all sorts of haters out there. Um, and there hasn't really been any. So, uh, again, you guys have been amazing. I also have a new product I am launching called Rocket FFL. It helps people get their FFLs, become SOTs. So, like, I just told you how my uh, Mossberg shotgun just showed up at my FFL. I don't mean this FFL I use. I mean my FFL, my gun store. It showed up at today. You can have an FFL too. You can have guns at distributor or wholesale prices. You can even have them shipped to your house. You can become an SOT so that you can have machine guns. You can get silencers, sharp railed rifles. Uh, matter of fact, a SIG MPX 8 inch barrel SBR showed up uh, late last week for me. Um, it's kind of nice having an FFL and I make the money back. So a lot of people are worried about the cost. Well, a dealer's FFL is 200 bucks to start. 
plus my course, which right now I'm running it on a promotion for sale for about 50 bucks, to make sure that you make the right decisions on what business you do, you learn the backgrounds, ATF compliance, you get your FFL. Uh, 250 bucks? I mean, you can get a Glock from Lipsy's, which I highly recommend using Lipsy's. Matter of fact, use Rocket FFL, and I've got you a hookup that they'll work with you when you work out of your home. So you don't have to worry about being a home-based FFL and not having a retail storefront. You go through Rocket FFL, I will get you a distributorship set up with Lipsy's. And over 500 bucks per order, which is easy to do, it's one Glock at 440 bucks and an extra magazine if you want, it's free shipping and it's in two days. So it's like Amazon Prime, but for guns. So you get your FFL and you get this Amazon Prime, but for guns, and you have guns shipped straight to wherever your FFL location is and you can sell them. So you sell a Glock, easily can make $100 per Glock. Your second Glock, you've made your money back for the cost of the license. I mean, that's a no-brainer. You get some silencers, get some other things in there. You can actually make some good side money, some side income doing what you love. So I'd appreciate if you guys would go check it out. Uh, it's something that I hope will succeed, rocketffl.com. So, all right, back to the information you guys are really here uh, for, not for advertisements. Uh, velocity. That's what I wanted to talk about because I was talking about, uh, thanks Tyler, by the way, I appreciate that. You have the paperback and Kindle version. Um, with the mini shells, the problem is people are worried about like lower velocity. Like, well, what's going to happen? Is, is the, the, the cartridge, the shells are coming out slow, slower, the, the shot, I guess it's coming out slower. Yeah. And slower is not ideal always. I get it. But speed is not the end all be all. And I think that's a big problem in our industry or not even the industry, the people out there, is they think that speed is everything. I mean, I get it. As we talk about in the book, you know, we talk about how you calculate energy, you talk about how you calculate momentum. Speed's obviously the bigger, more important factor there. But guys, sometimes shooting is just shooting. Sometimes you don't need the absolute fastest laser beam uh, thing out there. For example, the Aguila mini shells. Uh, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and I have a piece of property that requires me to ride around my low riding lawnmower to get around to it all and I find snakes out there so for a snake gun I could either go get like a Taurus judge or something like that or I could mount or carry around a um, 14 inch shockwave with me which one do you think I'm going to do right now for a snake I don't need a two and three quarter or three inch shotgun shell those mini shells are perfect I have higher capacity lower recoil which means it's going to be easier to shoot that thing out of one hand anyway that's perfect for my purposes. For some people, I mean, if I can get these things to work reliably, and I don't know if I can, they might be good for home defense. I mean, buckshot out of those mini shells is still gonna be, in my opinion, better than a handgun. And you're still gonna have, if you use it in a shotgun with a buttstock, you're still gonna have a long gun that's maybe easier to aim and manipulate and use, but you're gonna have much lower recoil. Uh, but again, I get it. You're not gonna have all the velocity you need. But if you want the most powerful thing ever, always, then you better be walking around with a 50 BMG. I mean, any of us at any given moment, heaven forbid you have to use a gun to defend your life or the life of someone else, because that's gonna be something you have to live with the rest of your life. We all would like blink our eyes and have the magic matrix, whatever gun we have in our hands be bigger and more powerful. Of course we do, but we're, we're, we're constrained by real life and by stuff that we actually enjoy shooting that doesn't break our hands around there. So just for, don't go crazy on velocity. And that brings up two other points for me with velocity. Uh, three other points, actually. Is one, the 12 versus 20 gauge thing. I hear a lot of people ask if 20 gauge is okay for home defense. Sure, it's great for home defense. If that's what you've got and that's what you want to use, it's sure a hell of a lot better than a sharp stick. And also, 20 gauge kind of gets a, a bad rap that's undeserved. And if, in fact, it's not only more powerful than a lot of people think, it's actually too powerful in some situations. For example, an average like target 20 gauge load is seven eighths of an ounce of shot going about 1400 feet a second, okay? A target load for a 12 gauge, now I get it, a light load for 12 gauge is an ounce, maybe an ounce and an eighth, but the light ones are an ounce going how fast? 1400 feet a second. So the difference between a 20 gauge and a 12 gauge is an eighth of an ounce of shot going the exact same speed. Well, yeah, I get it. The eighth of an ounce is gonna make it feel like it kicks less, but the target is still getting seven eighths the amount of pellets. That's almost as much. And the problem with a 20 gauge for some people is they're smaller. They're smaller receivers, smaller barrels, smaller buttstocks. The entire gun is lighter, sometimes more than an eighth as much light. So 20 gauges can kick more than 12 gauges. 
Most people think that 20 gauge or this little baby, you know, 12 gauge cousin. It's not. Again, seven eighths of an ounce different or seven eighths of an ounce versus an ounce going the exact same speed and a much smaller or maybe lighter shotgun can kick just as much. Fine. Use it if you want. Don't use it if you don't. But again, the fastest, heaviest, most powerful everything isn't the end all be all. I'm trying to read some of the comments here. I'll have to wait and see what happens in Illinois before considering getting my FFL. Okay. Bob, I mean, because I understand there's the exemption issues out there, uh, but it still could be nice to have your FFL, even just for yourself. I mean, you have to be, uh, you have to intend to be engaged in the business. And Bob, you could do occasional sales here and there. Uh, it doesn't say you have to, you know, make a fortune, but it's still handy for yourself to have an FFL. Um, you're picturing a sawed off eight bore. <laughs> All right, go for it. Uh, send me a picture. And Matt carries a 50 BMG revolver. Uh, good for you, man. Uh, no need to be a revolver, though, because I imagine you're going to shoot it once and then drop it. So, uh, I know you're kidding. The other thing about velocity that I was thinking about um, comes into 22. Someone emailed me this, and I I responded to them with a kind of a long answer, and I realized I better talk about it to you guys, is I shoot 22 like crazy. I shoot a lot of 22 out of a suppressed bolt-action 22. The CZ-455, that's where it's at. You want a bolt-action 22 for a trainer, get the 455. Uh, stupid accurate, amazingly smooth bolt, awesome adjustable trigger. You can't get better than that gun in my opinion. Already comes threaded from the factory for the model I got for my silencer on there. Uh, don't waste money on subsonic 22, okay? CCI, arguably some of the best 22 out there, makes a, a load called standard velocity. That's just the name of it, CCI standard velocity. It comes in at just under 1,100 feet a second, which at sea level, 1,100 feet a second, or just a little faster, is the speed of sound. So standard velocity 22 is already subsonic. The stuff you're buying in the bulk packs, excuse me, is high velocity or hyper velocity, which is even faster, 22. So yeah, regular 22, which I used quote fingers there, is what you buy at the store in the bulk packs, isn't really regular standard 22. It's what's regularly available, which is high velocity 22, which is supersonic. So CCI standard velocity all day, dead quiet out of my silencer, uh, fairly inexpensive and really accurate and reliable. Uh, it's not quite as accurate as CCI green tag, which is their competition awesome stuff that shoots pretty little groups. But something nice about standard velocity and green tag, and I do not know why more manufacturers don't do this, is CCI was smart enough to make the standard velocity and the green tag have the exact same ballistic profile. So it's essentially the same bullet going the same speed, which means you can zero your rifle with the green tag if you want, have a tiny pretty little group, and then plank all day with the standard velocity, which still is a great group, still better than your bulk ammo, but it's gonna be a little bit bigger group. And then when you wanna shoot a nice group again, you just throw the green tag in. There's no changing your zeros because the bullets hit the exact same point of aim and point of impact just one's a bigger group than the other one, but they're centered around the same spot. So I say you just do those. Uh, don't, again, go crazy on all the other subsonic ammo. I'm checking out some of CCI's new, what they call Copper 22. It's an extremely lightweight 22 round that's just supposed to be zipping. It's not even that new. It's been out for a little bit, but it's new to me. So I'll try it and I'll report back to you guys and see what you think. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about for velocity is uh, precision rifle. That's what you guys listen to me for anyway, right? Uh, speed's not everything, you know, higher velocity is not necessarily more accurate. It's not even necessarily better. I mean, I've had countless rounds of 308 sent out of a rifle. I mean, that's what I shot forever. It's what I learned on. 308 compared to some of these newer cartridges is like a slug. It goes slow. It has a big arch as it flies, you know, through the air. I, I get it. It's not as fast as 6.5 Creedmoor, but it works great. I mean, it really does. Now I'm finally converting over to 6.5 Creedmoor myself. I'm going over to the dark side and I like that speed and the velocity there, but again, it's not everything. What speed does for you with a bullet is it gets the bullet to the target faster. That's it. Now getting to the target faster means it's not gonna have as much chance to drop. That's not that it has some sort of magic inertia as it flies through the air because it's going so fast it somehow resists falling. If you've read my book, you know that's not true. But what it does is since it gets the bullet to the target faster, it doesn't have as many seconds in the air to drop due to gravity. So it's gonna drop less just because it had less time exposed to gravity. But it's also gonna move less with the wind. So the faster it gets going, the faster it gets the target, the less it's exposed to the same 
you know, wind, so it's not gonna probably deviate as much. The problem is these faster bullets are also lighter. So even though it gets there faster, that shorter amount of exposure to wind might actually end up moving some bullets more because they're lighter and they're easier to move. So uh, I get it, speed helps, there, there's a lot of benefits to it, but the guys when they're reloading, I'll hear them say, well, I'm doing this load, I'm getting this many feet per second out of it. Uh, okay, if you never knew, knew the feet per second you got out of your bullet, it wouldn't matter. Uh, people that'll geek out about what twist rate their barrel has and exactly the feet per second of their bullet, I get it, it's important, I'm not saying it's not important. But what I am trying to say is, you don't need to know it just to be able to learn to shoot and have fun shooting. So I'm gonna get crucified for this, but if I shot at a target and I turned my scope to the shape that was a triangle on the turret instead of numbers, I didn't know what minutes of angle were, I didn't know anything, but I knew that if I turned the triangle that I was able to hit a target at 500 yards, does it matter that I know how fast the bullet's going or how fast it's spinning? In that case, no, it doesn't. Triangle, good trigger control, steady platform, bullet hits the target. Well, how fast was the bullet flying to get there? Uh, two, three, one thousand feet per second? I don't know, it hit the target. And you wanna shoot the tar target behind that, you need to move from the triangle to the square. It doesn't matter if it's shapes or numbers, you can do it. And then maybe, of course, you're gonna to have to know, you know the speed or things for the environment to see changes in environment. But even then, if I just had a ballistic software that said, go to triangle plus one more click, and that's what you need to do now, that's what you would do. So don't freak out about, uh, don't chase the all elusive velocity as if it's this uh, holy grail of a thing to do. No, it helps in some circumstances. In others, some cartridges perform worse. You start speeding them up too much, they start getting erratic, they start not working. So um, yeah, that's about as much as I had in my head to talk to you guys about velocity is uh, the, the 590 with the mini shells, the 20 gauge, 12 gauge differences, some 22 subsonic stuff, uh, things like that, and uh, with precision shooting, yes, velocity matters, but don't freak out about it. Uh, Brandon wrote in with a comment here for me. He said, if shooting with a rifle, wolf match target is wonderful stuff. All right, I'll try it. I've heard the same thing. Um, but yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. Kyle Kirby, nice to get access to this kind of free info from someone so knowledgeable. Thank you, Kyle. Um, but everyone else needs to know that Kyle sends me an email a week, I think, Kyle, <laughs> asking me questions. So it's not gonna be free for much longer, Kyle. I'm gonna start sending you invoices. So I'm just kidding, I appreciate you reaching out and trying to learn. Uh, ben writes, uh, welcome Ben. Hey Ryan, thanks for your videos. Do you offer any shooting schools? If not, any that I recommend? Maybe soon? I haven't had time lately, but I'm really doing some life kind of considering right here on what I should be doing. I should be writing the next books and teaching schools and things like that. Um, so no, I don't offer them right now. I don't have the time, I'm sorry. I, occasionally I do, so Texas Triggers is where I'll teach you at, at Colby Donaldson's Ranch in Texas. Um, if you guys have seen my uh, uh, luckiest shot I've ever made with a Barrett that was down at Texas Triggers, I already talked to Colby and said, hey, we need to get a class going again. So we're gonna advertise maybe late summer, early fall. We'll probably do a long range course out there. Um, but I'm thinking about doing some more, so I'll let you know, Ben, who I recommend. I cannot recommend uh, Jared Johnson with STA Training Group enough. Uh, there might be schools that have better equipment or better, I don't know, but in my experience, I am really turned off by instructors that try to beat their chests or try to uh, be a Billy Badass and, uh, or have a closed mind about you have to do it their way or the highway or things like that. And Jared is the closest I can find to me, honestly, is easygoing guy, uh, loves to teach. He's got a great school out there and I guarantee you'll be a better shooter after leaving him. So go check it out. STA training, Jared Johnson. Uh, hey Jay, welcome. I appreciate it. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, Rich, when's the new book going to be out? Oh, Rich, I don't know. Not soon enough. Uh, I was hoping the summer, but the longer it takes me to get it done, the more I'm nervous about it and the more I'm getting it out. So uh, I'll, I'll keep you up to date, man. Uh, Jim, uh, glad to be live. Glad to be live. Um, yeah, I need to come out of the re reloading room. Yeah, uh, gotcha. I won't develop an alias. I'll be me. Um, I don't know that much about reloading. I mean, I think I do. I know enough that I'm going to put in the book, but man, I learn about reloading all the time, Jim. Uh, and part of that is because most of my training, let me rephrase that, all of my training, we didn't reload. It was just, I, I shot what I had and, and, and I'm learning as I go, but I appreciate it, Jim. 
so everybody, uh, that's a podcast that I owed you guys for the past week or two. Those are some thoughts I had in my head. Next time I already have some ideas because you guys have been reaching out about uh, mental checklists I go through when I go shooting at the range, uh, things like that. Uh, I'll try to make it live. Next time if I can, maybe we'll get you a different angle in my new office. Here's my new wood wall I put up. Just got my dad's old javelina up there. Let's see if you can see. Uh, got my antelope, if you guys can see it up there, just hung. Yeah, there we go. So I'm trying to get stuff organized. Um, it'll get put together eventually. I appreciate you guys joining me. Remember, spread the word about the book. I'll get the next book out as fast as I possibly can. And uh, while you're at it, go check out Rocket FFL and let people know about it. I mean, getting the FFL, becoming an SOT, and then even better, learning about firearms compliance, they stay out of trouble. It could be a side gig for you and a chance to make a lot of money in a market right now that seems soft on purchases, but it's not. It's just the market is flooded with inventory. So you can get guns now cheaper than ever from the wholesalers and distributors because they're hurting. Which means get your FFL and you can get everything super cheap right now. I'm seeing uh, DPMS AR-15s for $399, brand new. So, I mean, come on guys, go check it out. I appreciate everything you guys do. Uh, Till next time, take care.